Welcome, welcome to Christy Wuchuku's Brilliance TV show where we spotlight the accomplishments and defining moments of today's top business leaders, entrepreneurs, unique and most successful individuals. And that's where you come in because this show cannot exist without you. This show is for you and it's about you. So I would love for you to join me, become a part of this community. If you would like to be a guest on this show, please contact me at chosenpathglobal.com. Once again, chosenpathglobal.com. I'll be sure to get in contact with you. But listen, uh, before we get started, I just want to announce that I have my very first event this month, my very first event for Epic 2018, and that will be on January 27, beginning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. This is going to be my tele-summit, my very first event. And I am looking for you. I'm calling on all the speakers. If you are a speaker, if you are an author, if you are a marketer, salesperson, a coach, and you want to get your message across, you want to be seen and be heard with a list of over 50 thousand people on social media as well as email please this is a show for you and i want you to be a part of that teleconference i'm going to put up a link for you to register and you want to be sure to register as soon as possible before all the spots are filled up and so now that i have that out of the way i am super super excited for this special edition of christy wuchuku's brilliance tv show and we do this show normally every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. But today, I have a special guest. And so I'm doing this on a Tuesday at 6 p.m. We're having te te uh, technical difficulties, but um, it's all worked out right now. I am super excited for today's guest being from coming to us all the way from Arizona. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this brother. Uh, brother... Ghazi Mohammed, he's my brother from another mother. And he's a speaker, a trainer, an author, and he's an author of a straight up, straight up, 17 lessons on learning, on living authentically. Brother Ghazi is affectionately known as Brother Ghazi. That's what we love to call him. And Brother Ghazi has been inspiring youth, parents, and educators for over 20 years. His straight talk and passion electrify audiences across the nation. He's the founder of Ghazi Speaks and the Back on the Track Movement, founder and CEO. I am super excited. If you are watching right now, and I want you to go ahead and grab your pen and paper, ready, call people you know, invite people to the show because he is about to bring it. The next person I bring to the mic now is Brother Ghazi Mohammed. Brother Ghazi. Yes, ma'am. How you doing, How? I am good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Happy I am so you. I'm so looking forward for this interview today. My goodness, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I know you are a hard worker and you just got out from work, but you still make the time to join me. So I don't take that very lightly. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, you and I met back in October at BBS Black Bell Speakers Training hosted by Dr. Ruben West. And we've been connecting uh, ever since. Yes, yeah, that was a beautiful event. Dr. West put on a very beautiful event in Charlotte. I'm messing yeah. with people that including you, you know? Huh? What'd you say? No, I say I met some very incredible people in Charlotte. That's absolutely you. right. Thank you so much. And I'm so looking forward for another event in about back, I think in April of this year. So I'm looking forward for that one as well. So I am super excited. I cannot wait for this interview today. So this interview, I want to I wanna go back and have you pull the curtain a little bit for some of the audience that don't know who you are and the great work you've been doing in the community for years. 
pull the curtain a little bit and tell us how you've been able to embrace your brilliance. You know, oftentimes we hear all the accolades when people are on the top. We don't normally hear when they are in the valley. And I believe that the greatest lessons are learned in the valley. So if you can pull the curtain a little bit and share with our audience how you come to embrace your brilliance, Brother Gazi. Man, if you tell me I pull the curtain on valley, we'll be pulling all day long, Christy. <laughs> I, you know, I seem to uh, live in the valley, you know? And, um, you know, it's a place that I've um, come to, to be very familiar with, you know, being in the valley. But um, just a little bit about myself. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, originally. Um, I've been here in Arizona for the last 10 years, going on 11 years. Um, and I moved my family out here. Uh, at that time, it was my wife and seven children I moved out here. And uh, we had one child since we've been here in Arizona, my youngest girl, my baby girl. She's here. So um, that was a um, big move for us. But um, go rewind back 20 years, 30 years ago. Um, I come up in St. Louis, you know, the, the average type, uh, you know, brother, I guess it's average from the neighborhood I come up in. You know, we come up in the streets, you know, fighting and hustling and, you know, pistols and stealing cars and, you know, doing um, what we thought we supposed to do to survive the um, rigorous lifestyles of the, of the hood, of the ghetto. So, um, you know, I wound up going in and out of juvenile at a very young age. Um, in 1985, I was in drug rehab. That's when the uh, crack epidemic had first hit the, the, the inner cities um, and the war on drugs took place where a lot of young, um, especially young black men were being uh, railroad, railroad with uh, unjust crack laws and they was getting um, an exorbitant amount of time for as prison sentences goes. And um, during that time that, you know, I, you know like, like everybody else, you know, I seen Scarface and I seen them had the drugs and the money and the women and, you know, I thought that that's what all are supposed to do. So I started snorting drugs at a young age, you know, and wound up in rehab at 14 years old. Um, came through rehab, went to juvenile, you know, um, still was pretty much in the streets, you know, hard-headed, you know, uh, didn't really learn a lot of lessons. Then by the time I was 16, I got into a lot of trouble, and uh, I was facing 50 years to life in prison. I wound up getting 15 years, which I served probably eight years of that 15 in prison. Um, so from 16 to 24, I was locked up. And I've learned a lot, a lot of lessons during that time I was in prison, you know? There's a lot of lessons. But I got out in 1995. I got out right before the historic Million Man March that took place in October, October 16, 1995. And that was really a turning point in my life. Um, I remember going to my parole officer, asking him, like, you know, like a lot of black men going to D.C. You know, I want to go to D.C., you know, with the brothers. And my parole officer was a black man, you know? And uh, he said, well, you can't go up there because you're on parole and you can't cross state lines while you're on parole. So I already had in my mind, like, man, I'm going to D.C. Uh, you want to, I, I wasn't said nothing he was talking about. So, you know, I wound up going up there anyway at, at the risk of being violated. But mm -hmm. on my way out, it was so many brothers saying, man, you got to go to D.C. You got to go to D.C. Go to D.C. for us, you know, almost like to represent the brothers who ain't here, you know, so. I felt I was obligated to go up there to Washington, D.C. and to, to see all them brothers. I mean, I remember going on the mall at 5 o'clock in the morning and to see hundreds of thousands of brothers, I mean, it, it just blew my mind. And it really put some of my head about, you know, it solidified in my, in my brain about changing directions in my life, you know? Wow. Everybody, if you are just, um, just joining us right now, Christy Wuchuku, and I am so delighted to be talking to Ghazi Mohammed today. And he's sharing a lot of information, how to unmask and get back on track, chisel away the BS, get back on track so that you can manifest your greatness in 2018. And I want you to really stay till the end of this video because he has some news and some goodies that he's going to share with us. So, Brother Gazi, this is quite interesting because, you know, at that very young age, what was going through your mind at the, at, at the age of 14 years old? 
having to be seeing the things that children will never have to see. How did that impact your life? Well, it, um, you know, I think now um, that kind of lifestyle is more prevalent now. Um, but, but, but back in the 80s, it wasn't like, you know, um, so widespread in the inner cities. You know, you know, we had our violence and our drugs. And, but now I think it's, you know, more widespread. But with me, um, it just hardened me, you know. It made my heart hard towards society. You know, um, I didn't believe in no laws. I don't want to follow nobody's structure or none of that. You know, I was very rebellious in school. I was never, um, like, 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 I guess, dumb in school. You know, I, I was always the type, you know, I remember teachers would tell my mother, they would say, this boy can skip school for two weeks. Like, we don't even see him. My mother think I'm going to school every day. I would leave the house with my backpack on. I would throw my backpack in some bushes. And I was, you know, I would diss school. And I would come home. And I, at the time, I was supposed to come home, get my backpack, come in the house, and fake like I'm doing some homework. And, you know, and because my mother, she, she worked. And she, she didn't really check on what I was doing, you know, at the time. I got that off for a long time. And the teacher would tell my mother, like, this boy can, like, like not be in school two weeks a month. But he can come to school and take a test, and he'll ace it. Because I always had like a, you know, I was always smart, so to speak. You know, I would love to read. I just was very delinquent. You know, I had a um, uh, infatuation with street life. You know, I wanted to be in the fast life. And, you know, I wanted the money and the women. And, you know, I wanted the, the ghetto power. So, you know, it impacted me in a way because I didn't know my father at the time. I didn't meet my biological father until I was 14 years old. And uh, I remember the, the very first meeting that I had with my father you know, it, 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 it was very strange, you know. He and I are real close to this day. But prior to being 14, I had never seen his face. I didn't know how he looked. I knew his name, but I had never seen him before. And my mother was actually about to have me kicked out of the house until I was 21. She's been put me out or had me locked up till I was 21 because I was in too much trouble. Because she had already made a deal with the juvenile authorities to have me locked up for seven years from 14 to 21 until I became a quote-unquote adult. And... It just so happened her boyfriend at the time came over to the house with um, who was my a friend of my father's, and my mother was like, you know, um, like, like 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 this guy know your dad. I'm like, oh man, do, do you have my father's number? He gave my father number, and you know, I called him, and you know, he was like, who is this? I'm like, I'm your son, <laughs> you know. And it was a strange conversation, and um, you know, my twin brother, I have a twin brother, my twin brother now we caught the bus from St. Louis to East St. Louis, Illinois, to meet my father for the first time. And on that first day, I said to my father, I said, look, man, I'm going to have to live with you because mom finna put me out and have me locked up till I'm 21, and I ain't going to have nowhere to go. And I probably, I think I just thought, I just got through finna smoking some weed. I had my hat, Ace Deuce, and, you know, I, I was, like, in the streets. And, you know, my father was looking at me. He like, you want to come live with me? <laughs> and he, he talked to his wife, and his wife said, okay, you know, we'll let him come live with us. You know, and that was the first time I, that I met my father. But growing up, I didn't really, you know, I didn't know my father. You know, I had uncles in my life. I had, you know, brothers who, who was like surrogate uncles, and they were trying to tell me something positive. I just had that infatuation for the streets, though, at that time. Wow. Wow. So what, what, what do you think, because now with so much divorce rate, the divorce rate is very high. And oftentimes the children are the ones that suffer the most. And oftentimes as adults, we tend to blame the children as well. But, but what got them there is what for the most part we never really try to deal with. What do you think the absence of a father figure, a father? Oh man. Like... How did you think that contributed to you steering the wrong way? Oh, big time, big time, big time. Because, you know, like now that I do the kind of work that I, 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 I'm engaged in, especially dealing with um, inner city so-called at-risk youth, um, what I'm learning is that a large number of men in prison of all ethnic groups, the large majority of them did not have a father in their life. A lot of young um, boys in juvenile facilities didn't have a father active in their life. And I'm big on not just a... Um, a person who, who, who produced you, I'm talking about a man that's acting like a father. He's giving you good guidance. He's providing for you. He's t 
teaching you things. And that's a father to me, not just somebody who, you know, who had sex with your mother and, you know, they, they, they got together and she, she got her pregnant. That ain't necessarily a father, you know, to me. A father is somebody who can also further you in life and things like that. So when, 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 when young boys are missing that in their life, I know with me, I was longing for that. You know, I always wanted to, 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 to see my father and learn how to, you know, teach me how to throw a ball and how to hoop and, you know, how to talk to girls and stuff like that. So I learned a lot through trial and error. You know, my mother, she was at the age of 20. My mother had been married twice and had five children by the time she was 20 years old. So she was a single mother. She come up in the streets, you know, she dropped out of school at a young age, very strong, you know. She passed um, a, a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, she passed. And, um, but she was straight up, she was rough in the streets, carried pistols and, you know, uh, she hustled herself because that's kind of lifestyle she come up in. And so she did the best that she could. She gave me a lot of, a lot of my characteristics. I definitely attribute to my mother, her strength, her um, street savvy. You know, I've learned a lot from her that um, I never take them away from my mother. But, but I think about my father and like, man, you know, what could my life have been if I'd had that nurturing, loving, supportive, you know, manly, strong, disciplined, and, and respect in the man, you know, cause my mother, and she had boyfriends, and some of my, you know, I didn't know my father, but most children, when you deal with a woman who got children, and a man coming to their life, when the children start rebelling, one of the first things they say is, you ain't my daddy. I mean, I didn't know my daddy, but I'm telling him, you ain't my daddy, so you can't tell me what to do. You can't whoop me, because you ain't my daddy. Even though I didn't know my daddy, you know? And some of them men, they really gave me an example of the man that I'm, I'm, I'm evolving into, you know, in terms of being a family man. My mother had five children, and some of these men came in and took care of these, my, my, my mother and five children. They paid bills, they bought us clothes, they bought us shoes and things like that. So, you know, a man being present is very pivotal to not only young boys, but young girls too. Sure, sure. So what I'm hearing you saying is really the fact that your dad wasn't in your life and the fact that your mom was in your life, that wasn't just the love, the only type of love that you were craving for. Right. And so growing up at that very young age, how did you get to be where you were? With, was that... Is that is that what you saw at home? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw it at home, and you know, I come from the, like the West Side in St. Louis, and uh, it, it was a pretty much impoverished um, black community. You know, like everybody around me. Like I mean, from kindergarten to the time I got in high school, uh, or the time I went to prison, most of the guys I grew up with, that was my friends. Almost all of us went to prison, and if we didn't go to prison, we got killed at a young age. I mean, I can, as I'm talking to you, I'm just thinking in my mind, all of the young guys who was my age killed at 14, 15, 16 years old. Some of them, I watched them get shot. Some of them, I held their body. They're, they're taking their last breath. And, you know, we're trying to revive them. And, I mean, these images are still in my mind. So, you know, I've seen that. So, I, I, in my mind, you know, um, that was life. I thought that was all life. I thought the whole world was like that. I thought everybody was used to hearing gunshots and, seeing uh, winos and drug addicts. I thought everybody like that because we never left our hood. We never left pretty much the neighborhood, you know? Wow. So, so, you know, as you are talking, I can't even imagine as a young boy, I grew up with both my parents, loving parents that I had, but both have passed away since. But I can't even, as you are talking, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, and yes, I'm a girl, but like you said it so well, even for a girl, a father, a father figure being in your life has a different meaning. It's different from the love of a mom. A love of a father is, I can't even describe it being a woman, what that meant to me. And now I see you, I get to see your, your, your children on social media, your interaction with your children. How has that experience at very young age shaped you to having this awesome relationship with your children now? Well, because um, when I went to prison, 
my I had one daughter. And I went to prison. My my older daughter is um she'd be 30 years old in April. And uh, she was just a few months when I got locked up. She was probably four or five months, April, May, June, July. She's four months. And um, so I used to have a picture on my wall, on my prison wall. You know, my sister sent me some pictures of her. She had her first birthday. And, you know, I wasn't that for none of that. But I would have a picture on my wall. And as I'm reading my books, about, as I'm working out, or I'm in solitary confinement, I would always look at that picture. And, it would, and I would say to myself that when I get out of here, I'm not going to be nothing like the father that my father was. So him not being in my life like that created in me a desire to be a better father than he was to me because I know how I felt coming up. So I didn't want none of my children to feel like that, you know? So when I got out of prison in 95, um, I had a baby every year for the first four years. And uh, they about two different women, you know? And, <laughs> you know, I jokingly tell people, you know, I had to make up for lost time, you know, because <laughs> I was gone for a while. And um, I had four children, and they were about two different women. One of them I, I was married to, and the other one, um, you know, we was never married. But then, as God would have it, um, he blessed me with custody of all four of them children. Okay. And, I, I mean, I, I'm looking back on it now. It wasn't planned like that. It, it just happened like that. And I believe this right here. Because prison hardened me. My heart was hard. It was me against the world. Because when I went to prison, I didn't have family writing me letters a lot. Um, I, you know, two of my sisters, they used to write me letters every now and then, send me some money every now and then. But I didn't get a lot of visitors. I didn't get, like, money from my family. So I was, like, in there pretty much by myself for the most part. So my heart became hard. And emotionally, I, I divorced myself from my family and the outside world. I didn't care about nothing or nobody emotionally. I wasn't connected with nobody. So because my heart was like that, I believe that God blessed me to get custody of my children, to reawaken in me a part of my humanity that prison took. Because when I got them, they was baby still, you know. Um, they were um, like one of my sons was 18, now he was like 10 months when he started living with me, you know. So he was telling pampers, and, and I had the... I had some other human beings outside of myself that I had to be concerned about and nurturing and loving because I was going to protect them at all costs. And I developed so much respect for single parents, especially single mothers, because I was doing the earning, the cooking, the cleaning, the doctor visits, the PTO, the daycare. I was doing all that that a woman do. And I say, man, this stuff is hard. It was really rough. But I did it, though. And I developed a lot of respect for women who raise their children. It really developed a lot. Of, and it kind of gave me balance, you know, that hardness that prison uh, uh, put in me or, or that experience put in me, it kind of balanced me out and made me more humane and, 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 and more like, you know, compassionate, a little bit more compassionate, not, not totally, but a little bit more compassionate. Wow. Listen, I want to go back to, I want to go back to what you really mean by a mask. Chisel away the BS. Right. And okay. get back on track to manifest your greatness in 2018. Okay. I'm sure it's not the BS that we all know about, right? Right. So uh, can you share with us what you mean by that? Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you a story of, of, of why, uh, how I know about masks and how all of us, sometimes we go through things, even if you didn't come up in the, in the, in, in the ghettos and in, in horrible conditions, we all still have experiences that we're ashamed of. We have experiences that we don't want nobody to know about. You know, we have, um, um, we've made choices that, that has affected us to this day and we suppress it deep down on the inside of us. And what happens is we start wearing masks and these masks um, shield us, we think, from the outside world. We don't want people to know what's really going on in our heart and our mind and our inner self. So I remember a time when I was, um, when I came home from prison, um, I was on a, 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 a part of a panel of people, at the time I was working for a nonprofit in St. Louis, St. Louis Caring Communities, and I was a part of a panel in East St. Louis, Illinois, the Jackie Joyner Center. And there was a panel dealing with all youth. And it was like six people on this panel. And as the moderator was announcing each one of these persons, he was talking about the degrees they had, how they traveled the world, 
all the accolades and what they accomplished, the rewards they got or awards that they got. And I was the last one. And every time he announced somebody, I was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking because I didn't feel worthy to be up there with them people. I thought to myself, like, hey, these people got degrees and they educated, they travel the world. I shouldn't be up here with them. I should be down there listening, you know? And but when it came down to presenting to the young people, hands down, I mean, like it was like, you know, we had a very impactful presentation. So when it came down to questions and answers, the uh, moderator, most of the questions came towards me. Probably 80% of the questions were directed towards me. The moderator had to stop the young people and say, look, we got five other panelists up here that y'all can ask questions to. And one young guy in, 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 out there, he was a little, a, a little gang member. He was a gangster disciple. He said, but Brother Muhammad is the only one up there that's real. Mm. He's the only one up there that we can relate to. And I thought about what he said. And I said this to that young boy, that young brother, and it was a turning point in, in my life. He said, um, I said to him, I know you think I'm real because I told you that my mother was a hustler, that she turned drug addict. I didn't know my father till I was 14 years old. I didn't grow up with, with a father. I was in our juvenile, in rehab, in prison. So to you, that, that, that makes me real. I say, but young brother, I don't never want you to think that my proximity to hardship authenticates me. Ooh. I don't want you to think that because I came up in that hard life, that's, that, that that alone makes me real because they don't. Now, some of these people, up, at least one guy up on that panel, I knew. I know he never smoked no joints. He never dealt with no drugs. He never stole a car, never had a pistol. He never did none of that kind of stuff. But he had the kind of heart that he would give the shirt off his back for every young person that was in that audience right there. And I knew that because he had a big heart. So I told him, I say, so many people up here, I know they some real human beings. So I don't want you to think that because you come up through hardship, it's what make you real. But what that taught me was this right here. Because the message that I presented was so impactful, it made me start looking at myself and what I had behind. Because I didn't feel like I was worthy. I didn't feel like I should have been up there with them kind of people. But it made me understand that your message and your experience has a place. You know, and in this place is good. It can be effective in this place. It may not be good for all platforms and all people, but in that in that environment, it was good because I was coming from my heart. I was coming from not what I read or what I heard about, but what I had actually experienced. So that's what kind of made me start looking at myself and, and, and put me on a journey of taking off these masks, the mask of shame. You know, the mask I wore, you know, was a mask of shame. You know, I had felonies and you know, used an ex-con and, you know, the kind of life, how my mother was, and you know, she was dealing with drugs, to, even to her death. And you know, she was struggling with, with, with crack, with, with crack addiction, and a um, very strong woman, but, but she had, a, you know, she had her flaws. And um, so I wore that mask of shame. And the more I peeled the mask off and was true to myself, I started understanding that when you peel the mask off and you be authentic with yourself, that intensifies your magnetism. It makes you more attractive to people because you just you. I became transparent. I didn't have nothing. So now I can look back and all of my experiences and every lesson that I've had, good, bad, or ugly, and I can find a lesson. Every experience, I can find a lesson from it. So now people, all my life, people told me experience is the best teacher. Now I don't really say experience is the best teacher because I know people who experience the same thing over and over and over and over again. I know drug addicts who the first time they hit that pipe, they went straight down, they lost everything. The second time they hit the pipe, they did the same thing. I know brothers who go in prison. The first time you stole a car, you went to prison. The second time you did a crime, you went to... I mean, so the experience itself is not the best teacher, but I believe in every experience does a lesson. And that if you get the lesson from the experience, that lesson will catapult your life to another level. It'll take your life to a whole other level if you get the lesson. Now, if you don't get the lesson, you're going to have to repeat that experience until you get the lesson. Oh, wow. You dropped some nuggets here. Definitely. You dropped some nuggets here. Listen, you know what you just said is so true. Because even as a speaker, as a coach, as a salesperson, when people can really relate to you, they're eager to learn from you. When they can relate to your life experience, your stories, they can learn from you. But have you ever been to uh, a speaker where the speaker is talking and you're saying to yourself, I don't belong here. 
And oftentimes, I think people put the mask, like you said, to protect themselves from whatever they're trying to hide from. But I've come to learn that oftentimes when you become real, when you become true to yourself, when you become relatable to people, that oftentimes people really appreciate you more than you can ever think. Because I myself, I English is my second language. And for years, I, I mean, a lot of things that people say, a lot of slogans, a lot of adages, and I'm not familiar with it, but I will hate to raise my hand or ask somebody, what are you talking about? Because I was embarrassed that people uh, will think, uh, will know that I don't know it. But what I realized is that once I said, I'm gonna ask regardless, just give me the response, give me the answer. I don't really care what you think about. What I realized is that people really do appreciate it and people will respond and give you the information that you need. So mm -hmm. absolutely being relatable to people makes a big difference. And you because know, when it comes and down to it, people just want to associate with somebody that they can relate to. Right. And you know, I, you know, I, you know, recently, you know, I was at a um, event and doing a presentation and um, one of the ladies said, um, Brother Gaza, you're a remarkable speaker. You know, you, you know, you're a very good speaker. And I thought about what she said and I, and I look at myself because I still talk like hood. You know, I still got what Nelly and St. Louis, Louis hip hop artist called country <laughs> grammar. You know, um, I still say her and there and bathroom and, you know, that's just how I talk, right? So I, I look at myself and, and, and I understand this. I'm not the most articulate and eloquent speaker in the room. I'm not going to be the one that enunciate and pronunciate words with superior excellence. That may not be me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come so far deep from my heart. It's going to be so genuine and so real. It's going to connect to people who hear me. See, because, I'm, because it's coming from the heart. So I'm not the best communicator, but I'm a dad good connector. I know how to connect with people heart to heart because I'm coming from my heart. I'm just coming from some stuff, some quotes I done read. And, you know, even though I may say some quotes, but if I say some quote, it's going to resonate with the experience I have from my heart. So when I say it, it's going to be another energy behind it. I ain't going to say it just to impress nobody. I'm not into impressing people. I, the philosophy is love me for me or, you know, don't love me at all, you know, and help me. If you see areas of my life that I need improvement in, then help me improve in them areas. And I'm going to do the same for you. And if we do that with one another, each, each one reach one, each one teach one, then, you know, we can grow and evolve as a community and uh, as a nation and as, as a planet, you know? You know, I love what you said because I think nothing, nothing, not amount of education, nothing can beat when you connect with people heart to heart. Because that's really what everybody wants, is connection, connecting with people heart to heart. It's not about dotting your I's and crossing your T while that is great. Right. But oftentimes what you find is that some people will bury themselves in shame. Right. Will bury themselves and not coming out and be so fearful to share their message because they're so much worried that people are not going to receive the message well because they are not very articulate. And that's why I really appreciate what you do. I really appreciate the work that you do in the community, helping the teens to make sure that they get back on track. So how has your experience helped you in working with these teens? Uh, yeah, well, you know, just, you know, for one, giving me the kind of heart to, to and the desire to want to work with them because, um, you know, getting in trouble at such a young age, you know, I'm going to say this is where I come from. So when I got my GED and I was locked up, I started tutoring friends of mine and other people, and some of them I grew up with, and I had no clue that they was illiterate. These guys I grew up with, we was on a basketball court, playing baseball, kickball, just having fun in the, you know, in, you know, in the neighborhood. 
And I had no clue that some of these guys couldn't read. We was in high school. But they were, you know, they just pass along a lot of, like, inner city children, black children. They just pass us. We, you know, whether we get the lesson or not, they just get past that next grade, you know. And so some of my close friends, people I grew up with, they, I, I was realizing that they couldn't read. So I started tutoring some of them and um, to, to, you know, learn how to read so they can get their GED, too, because I was real excited that, that, you know, I finally got my GED, you know. And um, on my way out of prison, I, 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 I was on my way out probably about eight months before, before I was released. And I was in solitary confinement in a, in a, in a, in a prison in Jefferson City, Missouri. And um, I would listen to these two young men talk. And their conversation affected the core of me because I was on my way out. And I, I, at that time, I was 23, um, about to turn 24 at the time. And these young guys, one was 16 and one was 18. The one that's 16 years old, he had life without the possibility of parole. He was never getting out. The guy who was 18 years old, he was eligible for parole in about 30 years. He can go for parole. So now this is how that conversation went. As I laid on my bunk, listening to these young brothers talk, and we was in solitary confinement. I was laying there on this little slab of concrete with a little thin mattress and rats and roaches in this little place. And I'm sitting there listening to them talk, yelling between cells. And the one guy who can get out in 30 years, he said this. He said, hey, cuz, by the time I get out of prison, I will be um, 48 years old. He say, when I get out, I can still give me a wife. I can still have me some children. I can still do something in my life, huh, cuz? It won't be too late, will it? You know? And as I heard him say that, I listened. I'm like, damn. I just did seven, eight hard years. And this guy's preparing the next 30 years of his life behind bars. But what got me in, a, in this conversation was, no matter what crime he committed, no matter how rough he was in the streets, I listened to his humanity. This young brother still wanted a wife. He still wanted children. He still wanted to do something with his life. And I, I, I don't know if he made it out or not. You know, um, that was in 91. So you got old one. You, so he's still locked up. So, you know, that was in 1991. No, 1994, when that conversation took place. That was 1994. So this young guy is still locked up. Um, but when I heard that, it kind of solidified in me that, man, when you get out, you got to really do something with a lot of these young guys because almost everybody coming in, you know, when I first went in, you can count on one hand the number of young black males that was in maximum security prison in Missouri that was under 21 years old. When I got out in 95, probably 50 to 60 percent of everybody coming in was 15, 16, 17 years old. It was all high school students, you know, cause, because because um, the um, um, drug laws, you know, th th those crack laws, they was busting down. They was giving the brothers a lot of time, you know. And so I witnessed that transition in prison with a more youthful population. I was one of the first ones in that group right there back in the 80s to go to maximum security prison. So seeing that. It really affected me. So, so when I got out, you know, I, I mean, I really had my mind set on doing something to help the community. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, it was rough for me. Didn't nobody want to hire me when I got out. They didn't want to hire me. You know, I didn't have no work experience because I was locked up at such a young age. I never had a job before, for real, you know. Um, so I didn't really know what to do. You know, I'm putting the applications and, you know, every, everybody who's been to prison who, who got a felony, they know. Then when you get to that point on the application that says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? At that point right there, there's a physiological change that happens in your body. You start sweating, your heart start beating fast, your palms get wet because you know that damn, if I tell the truth, they may not hire me. But if I lie and they find out, they are gonna fire me. So, you know, I mean, you, you, it's almost like a, a catch 22 bag, you know? So I was forced to be a CEO. I ain't had no choice but to be an a, a entrepreneur. And, but, but that's where it came from, you, you know, my desire. And, and from that time to now, I've had a security company. I've had a hauling company in St. Louis where I had dump trucks. And um, everybody who worked for the company, who worked for my company at the time, they were all young gang members, all of them. They were all young drug dealers. That, that in my mind, I'm going I'm to try to teach you a skill 
and work you so hard while you're working, you're going to be too tired to go on the block after you get off work. You ain't going to want to go on the block. I'm, I'm going to put some, some concrete in your hand. I'm going to put a sledgehammer. You're going to – and I was working them. And, 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 and it was amazing because I gave them hard hats and steel toe boots and vests, and it made them feel like they were somebody. And I'll never forget one young brother named Lil Mike. He had his, – he was 17. He was a little crip. His girlfriend was pregnant. And his little Mike girlfriend and his mother came up to me one day, and they said, Brother Muhammad, I don't know what you're doing to little Mike, but he's becoming more responsible, though, you know? Because while I had them working, I was also teaching them, you know? I was also telling the thing, thing about being a man and, you know, being a father and being responsible and making better choices in life, and you know? And I was paying them, too. See, like, a lot of people come to these young people just talking to them. That ain't sufficient. That ain't sufficient. Because a lot of them young guys, they want some money. They want some money. So I'm always thinking of ways, how can I create jobs for these young guys? And I know if I'm paying them, they're going to listen to me too. You know, not just that I'm going to listen to you because you're an older person and you're supposed to be wiser, nothing like that. No, nah, I'm putting the paycheck in your pocket. And while I'm paying you to, to help you sustain your life, I'm going to also be putting something in your head. Every chance I get, I'm put something in your head. So, you know, I, I did that for many years, you know. Hey, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had like four or five different companies and businesses and you know, j just being creative and, you know, all at the same time while I'm taking care of my children and my family and my family is growing and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, now I got nine children now, you know, and um, so being a father and, you know, especially raising my own children, you know, has, has really affected my thinking, you know. Wow. Brother Muhammad, I don't even know what to say. You have such a beautiful soul. Each and every time I talk to you, I just want to appreciate you so much. Uh, the work you. that you do with these children, I mean, I saw you on several times speaking to the children and seeing how well your speech was uh, received. And like you said, it's all about reaching. I believe that everyone has a heart. And if you can, no matter how hard someone is, if you can reach that person's heart, you can make a difference in that person's life. If you can reach the person's heart, mm -hmm. you can make a definite difference in somebody's heart. And that's why I appreciate so much the work that you do with these children. You touch on a little bit that it's not about talking to these young children. Sometimes some of them can rebel because we adults, we don't always understand what's going on in their own world. Right. And things have changed mm -hmm. and things have really changed. Like you said, the absence of having a father, a role model for a young boy make a big difference. But thanks to God that we have somebody like you that are pitching in and helping these young boys really, really become somebody because we've all made mistakes in our life. I don't care what type of mistake. The mistake may be different, but we've all made mistakes and stayed another way in our life. It may be different from one person to another. But what I really admire so much about you is that it is not the adversity itself, but how you really handle the adversity that will develop how your life turns out. And that's exactly what you've done. That Thank you use you the adversity to do good right. and make sure that these young boys don't stay away. And if they have stayed away, that it's okay. They just don't know what they don't know. Right. That you can bring them back on track. That and let me you say this. Bring them back on track. And let me say this to, 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 you know, to your listening audience, to those who may see this video, or they, they watch it now, or they're going to watch it or replay later on. Sometimes we're talking to our young people, and especially these young boys, and we think as parents or as aunties and uncles and as teachers and um, pastors and ministers, sometimes we think these children are hard-headed. And, and some of them are hard-headed. I'm not saying they're hard-headed, right? But... If we look at ourselves like we are a, a farmer, I look at myself like I'm a farmer, and my job is to plant seeds in the minds of these young people. Now, I may not be around to watch that seed blossom, but if you plant the right seed, 
from a heart filled with love for these young people, that seed gonna take root in their mind. And I don't care what they go through in life, then their experience is gonna begin to cultivate that seed. It might be 15, 20 years down the line, but it's gonna be something, if the seed is never there, it'll never blossom tomorrow into a flower. So, you know, one thing we say we're back on track is that the, that the flowers of tomorrow are rooted in the seeds of today. So we plant seeds in these young people's mind from a heart of love. These young brothers and these young sisters are young people, period. And we just, just from a heart of love. And we know that we plant enough seeds out there. The rain going to come. The sunshine going to shine. And them seeds going to be cultivated. And a problem with it is a lot of older people, a lot of parents get frustrated because we think, because I planted the seed, I want to also see the harvest time. I want to also be the one that control the rain and the sun. And I want to see the seed blossom, but it might not work like that. But if you continue to plant a seed, a positive seed in these young people, at some point, they're going to grow up. At some point, their mindset going to begin to shift. At some point, they're going to say enough is enough. And when they get to that point, they're going to have all these seeds that you planted now to fall back on. But if we stop talking to them, because some people say, I ain't saying nothing to him because he's just too bad. You know, some of the worst ones in the hood, them the ones I like going to because everybody else and gave up on them. Don't nobody want to talk to them no more. But them the ones I want to go, even if they don't listen, they might not put their blunts down. They might not put their guns down. They might not stop gang banging. They might not stop hustling. But when I talk to them, I'm going to put a seed in their mind that I know one day, if they live and if they survive that ghetto life, I know one day it's going to be a shift in them and it's going to be a seed in their mind. They're going to be my man. I remember Brother Gazi. I remember this Brother Gazi said this. Uh, I remember Chrissy said that. I remember this person said that. And my auntie, my uncle, my mother, my father. But sometimes we get so frustrated with our young people that we don't want to deal with them no more. And we kind of write them off as though they're nothing. But I believe whenever I go to our young people, I have a ritual that I do. I bow down Ooh. to them. I literally Brother bow Gazi, to them. go on and preach. You can preach. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you so much. I am going to go back and ask you, you know, people stare away from the course. For some people, it affects them the rest of your life. What do you think that was going through your mind during that hard time? That instead of staying away because you've made a mistake, you came out better than it used to be. Why is that different from one person to another person? What can well, you share with that audience? Well, for me, I, I mean, I would only say like God, you know, like, you know, in a real way, because I was forced, um, during the time I was locked up, I spent probably 47 months total in solitary confinement. Now, for those who don't understand what that means, that means I was locked up in the small room 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When I came out, they let me out for one hour Wednesday, one hour on Friday. They let me out into a little small cage, like a big dog cage. And they call that recreation. So they let me out for an hour Wednesday, an hour Friday. Other than that, I was back in that cell. And when I was in that cell, though, I was forced because mama wasn't there, daddy wasn't there, wasn't no brothers there, wasn't nobody there. I was forced to begin to rely on God. I start reading scriptures more. You know, I got deeper into, you know, my faith. I started studying all religions more, you know. Um, I was listening a lot to um, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, listening to his tapes and, you know, reading materials about young black men being positive and growing up to be positive. And the more I read that, I nursed on that. But I can really say God, you know. And, and, and I think everybody gets to that point. I think some just get there sooner and some get there later. But I think all of us get to a point well, we know enough is enough. Some of us just get cut down before we get to that point. Some of us get killed or, you know, we kill ourselves or whatever. You know, we get so stressed out, bad habits, and, you know, we die of all these diseases before we get to that point. But I think all of us at some point, if we continue to live, we get to a point where we be like, enough is enough. I just want something different in my life, you know? So, but, but for me, I won't take no credit for that. I, I, I would literally say God and, you know, maybe the, the positive example of uh, Minister Farrakhan, you know, just being, a, being, being like a father figure to me. How, how um, as you mentor these youths right now, as you go around and speak to youths and impact and change 
their lives, bringing them back to back on track. What do you think that adults listening right now, parents in their life, how do you think they can really help these young children have a mindset shift to the right direction? Um, well, I would say to, to parents right now, you know, to, to, to understand this, that sometimes parents beat up on themselves because I know many, many parents that do the best that they can. They, I mean, they work their butt off for their children. They pay all these bills and they try to get their children the latest technology, the cell phones and the iPhones, the iPads and the video games and the nice clothes. And they, and they work hard to sacrifice for their children. And so when their children go left, the parents sometimes feel like they did something wrong. Like, damn, what did I do wrong? I worked, I, I fed, I provided for them, I, I told them something good, I took them to church, I took them to the mosque, I, I gave them books. What happened? But what we don't understand is this right here. See, it's statistical. About 40 years ago, the, the, the dominant influence with a child, especially a black child, in our community, the number one influence, it was like a like a, a order that it went into. And it was your parents, then maybe your um, pastor or minister, then maybe your school teacher, then your peers, right? 30, 40 years ago, it was like that. But now, the number one influence is parents, hey, yeah, man, they, they, they might be last. The preacher ain't even on the list no more in terms of influencing a lot of these young children. The preacher ain't even on the list no more. And the parents is last. So it's TV, it's video, like, you know, social media. Then it's peers. So, like, a parent, you may have your child for eight hours. And you may be teaching them or whatever, doing what you're doing. But while he at home, and he got them earphones, you know, them, them earplugs in his ear, and he watching all kinds of videos, and that's influencing him. He going to a school, and his, and his friends are sagging, and, and everybody else sagging, and everybody else smoking, and everybody else drinking, and that's influencing him. So... What you do is be 100 with your children. I mean, straight up be authentic with your children. So I have nine children, and none of my children, I, I, I thank the God, they never smoke. No, well, none except my oldest daughter. I'm saying like the ones that was with me since they was babies. You know, my 21-year-old, 20, 19, 18, 14, 12, 10, and 8. The older ones, you know, my son, like, they never smoked weed. They never drank and nothing like that, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't knock people who do what they do. If they got a little recreational wine or whatever, that's their thing. But I was so transparent with my children. I was so raw and so real with them. I wanted them to know the real deal. And I didn't just tell them just one side of it. I'm going to give you an example. My son, he's 21 years old now. He got his, my, my oldest son. He got his own apartment. He's working. He, he got his own car he paid for. You know, he don't have children. You know, he's in school for videography. He's doing pretty good. Now, I went to prison at 16. He went to college at 16. Same son. I broke that cycle right there, right? Now, when he was young, him and some of his friends, he went to some of his friend's house, and they were stealing at a local convenience store. And I was on my way to pick him up. So I seen them with all kind of food. They didn't see me. I seen them as I was driving down the street. So I called the father over of the friend whose house he was over. And I say, did you give them any money? He said, no. Nah. He said, no, nah, I ain't give them no money. He, he said, why? I said, I'm going to call you right back. So when they see me, they started throwing these goodies away, like in, in bushes and stuff, trying to hide them. And then, I, I, but I've not already seen them. So I get out of the car and, and I say, um, you know, what's all the stuff y'all throwing in the bushes? And I, you know, I go by the bush and look at it. They had chips and um, like um, candy bars and slushies. They had everything. I say, um, so where y'all get the money? you know, to, 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 to bat us from, you know, you know, children come up with the most creative lie. They think it's creative. <laughs> they told me this. They said, they said, we bought a, found a coupon. <laughs> one coupon. I say, I say one coupon got y'all all this. And they say, yeah, one coupon. So I told them, I say, if y'all tell me the truth, I'm gonna whoop all y'all, including my friend, son. And so the younger boy, he started telling they made me do it. You know, they, they, he was telling on them, right? Now, my son at the time, he was like 11, maybe 12 years old. So what I did with him, I didn't whoop him. I was angry with him because he could have gotten in trouble with the juvenile or whatever, you know. 
But what I did was this right here. I took my son and I took him to an area of Phoenix where they nothing but meth heads, drug addicts, dope fiends, and I let him out the car. I said, get out the car. And I mean, I drove down the street and around the corner, but I'm watching them. But I just said, get out the car. And he's walking around like scared and he's looking around and it's like meth heads coming up to him and they ain't looking like, what you doing out here? And he's looking and he's, he's petrified. He's scared like, what is this? And I let him stay in that condition for about 10 to 12 minutes. Then I come back on him and say, get in the car. I didn't say nothing to him. I took him down to a prison down here called Tent City. And, and, and it's like internationally known, Tent City, where you can stand outside the gate and you can watch the prisoners from outside the gate in, in, in the local jail in prison. I took them out there and I said, I want you to look at them men right there. All them, most of them men right there finna go to prison. Some of them finna do some hard time. They ain't never getting out. And most of them, some of them in there were thieves. They started stealing candy bars and potato chips and stuff like that. They started stealing from local convenience stores. That's just how it started. But then I just stopped right there. All then, as soon as we left there, I took them to Arizona State University. And we went to, to the gym and we watched the young boys playing basketball. I went to the library. He watched the young little college students doing their tests and you know, on the computers and stuff like that. Then I told my son this right here. I say, look, son, you're going to have a choice to make. And your choice that you make is going to affect your life. It's your path, your destiny, whatever choice you choose. I can't choose that choice for you. I can't choose your path. It's going to be on you. I said, you can either choose to be like them winos and drug addicts and dope fiends over on Van Buren, you can choose to be like them convicts in prison who got uh, caught up in criminal activities, or you can choose to be like these college students who want to be, who, who, who's ambitious and want to make some out of their life. And I, I, I just put out that to them. I say, now, whatever you choose, you my son, I still love you, but understand that your choice is going to determine your life, your, the, the, the course that your life takes. So I put all them choices before him, and luckily he chose the right choice, you know. He didn't, he didn't go the other route. He chose the right choice, you know. Wow. You know, that's a great lesson. And that's exactly what you were talking about, having a role model or a father. What you did was more education than anybody else could have taught them by just examples. That you, I mean, what you did was worse than whipping those, uh, those children. Okay. Right. But that was a great lesson that they will never forget and they will appreciate for the rest of your life. And you see how your son turned out. You see mm -hmm. how your son turned out. He, no, so, so, he made so, the right decision. So, so what I would say to parents is allow your children the, 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 the idea or to help develop them in, in them the ability to make choices on their own. Because I had to learn that I can't protect them from making mistakes. They're going to make mistakes. We, we made mistakes. Even if, even if you didn't go to prison, every parent made a mistake. They made a bad choice. They made bad decisions. Every, every, all of us do that coming up, right? And we learn from our mistakes, hopefully, you know, some of us. And um, so I don't try to prevent my children from making mistakes. I don't try to prevent them from making bad choices. What I do is this right here. I, try, I understand that you're going to reap what you sow. So I'm not going to prevent you from making bad choices because I understand that the choice is a lesson in that. And I want you to be able to get the lesson from that choice that you made. If you choose that right there, I'm, I'm, and in my mind, I want to show you what lesson is in that for you. Good, bad, or indifferent, I'm going to show you a lesson in it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to be there for you to support you when reaping time comes. Because if you make that choice, you're going to reap what you sow. If you sow it like that, it's going to come back on you like that. I'll be there for you to support you in reaping time. And my support is going to be trying to help you see the, the – the lessons in that choice, even if that was a bad choice, it's a lesson in it, you know? Wow, Brother Gazi, we definitely, I definitely have to bring you back because I know you have so much nuggets to drop and I appreciate you. We are coming to the end of the show and I just want to ask you, what do you have for our audience to experience you? I know you have a lot in the works. We didn't even get to talk about your book, Straight right, Up. Right, 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 right. So tell us a little bit about it. Okay, well, Straight Up, it's um, Straight Up, 17 Lessons on Living Authentically. And, um, you know, I go into the 17 diff different areas of our life, from spirituality to hip-hop to arts and culture to um, confidence and taking the mask off, different things in our life 
that um, areas that we should be authentic in. And the basis of it is this right here. You know how people say he's real or she's real. Okay. That's only one area they saying that in. The area that I related to you. So if I say, Krista, you're a real sister. I can say that because you and I relate on a certain level. But right. you may be real to me, but when it comes to your finances, you might not be real. When it comes to your husband, you might not be real. When it comes to your children, you might not be real. So it's like trying to teach us to be authentic all the way around the board. That's just in one area of our life. But the more authentic we are, the more magnetic we become, the more true to ourselves we are, and the more unashamed we are, even, even, even with the mistakes that we've made. It don't make no difference. Get the lesson, learn, grow, and, and, and take it to another level. So, you, you know, the book, Straight Up, 17 Lessons on Living Authentically, it can be ordered through my website at gazispeaks.com, or it's also on uh, Amazon. Um, and um, for your audience, what I have is, if anybody would like to contact me, I have a free one-hour consultation for anybody to contact. If you got nephews or sons or um, little cousins or next-door neighbor sons, somebody that you think is at risk, of going to prison, going to a life of drugs and gangs and violence. Um, I, I can give you all kinds of nuggets from my experience personally and from over the 25, 30 years of working with all type of boys in many cities across the country. I can give you all those, you know, bring all the nuggets to you. If I can be of any value just to serve you, to help these young people, I'm here. So you can call me at 602-544-6200. Three nine, that's my cell phone number, and um, if, if I don't answer, just leave me a message, and I can also be emailed at your path is unique at gmail.com. That's your path is unique at gmail.com. And I know you have um, you are getting ready to take back on track movement on the road. Tell us a little, just a pick about what's gonna be what to expect in 2018 with that back on track movement. Oh yeah, the back on track movement. So it's designed to help people pretty much get back on track. You know, um, all of us going, you know, all of us get off track at time because we're not perfect, right? So mistakes are born out of imperfection. And because none of us is perfect, we're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna miscalculate. We're gonna see things wrong at times. And it causes us to deviate or get off track with our goals, um, the, the whole back on track movement is really geared towards men and young boys to help them get back on track as fathers, as husbands, as um, brothers who are mentors and examples in the community, as uncles, as teachers, you know, help us get back on track with our finances. And it starts with being authentic with ourselves, being true with ourselves. And so, you know, we have um, a lot of uh, speaking engagements coming up that we're a part of. Um, definitely, we're going to be traveling. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have encountered um, brothers like um, Brother Trevor Ops and Shay Brown and, you know, the great Dr. Ruben West, you know, my big brother who's really helping Absolutely. me shoot my message and, you know, um, the whole Black CEO family, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, they have been a blessing to me, you know, to be a part of that, that whole family right there in the last few months, it's been a blessing to me um, personally, spiritually, psychologically, my my family see the difference in me. People that know me see the difference in me. So I'm learning a lot from the Black CEO family. So I want to encourage people to get up. If you've never heard of it, you can log on to Black CEO Morning Show um, and, and, and check it out. It's on Facebook. And listen in to it. If you got a business, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, if you want some good positive talk from brothers and sisters, that's an excellent show. It, it, I mean, it's just positive. It's a lot of good vital information that's relevant. Not irrelevant information, but relevant information. So um, I think hooking up with, with, with that crew, Trevor, Shay, um, Dr. Ruben West, and Dr. Stephanie Barnes, and Candace Camille, and Akia Taylor, Marsha White, and Barrett, and that whole crew right there, you know, they've really impacted my life. So I'm grateful to them for um, what they're doing to my life right now. And, you know, it's going to take things to a whole other level, I believe. I am so, so excited for you. You know, talk about the Black CEO, Trevor Arts, Ruben, Shea, and the rest of the crew. I mean, Trevor himself is like, the guy is genius. I mean, he's genius. What can I say about him? But anyway, um, if you get an opportunity 
just just google him be a part of that morning black, uh, black ceo morning show it is definitely one of the shows to to watch and one of the community to be a part of uh, even though it's called black ceo they serve everybody so definitely i appreciate you thank you so much and uh, i hope i'll be able to bring you back again to continue this conversation i know we're running out of time and um, i just want to thank you so much thank you for your time and thank you, um, thank you. Thank you again before we end i just want to let everybody know that i have an event coming on my teller summit on the 27th of january you do not want to miss it if you are a coach speaker salesperson marketer and you just looking to share what you know teach what you know sell this is a a place for you to be in and i'm going to put a link for you to register and you want to do that as soon as possible before all the spots are taken so thank you so much and bye for now <laughs>